All right, so today I'm first going to talk about how to load and unload data in the Anion. And then we're going to look a bit at the different kind of diagnostics that we have in the Anion. So loading data, as I've said before, uh, we group data in packages for loading. So a package is a collection of resources that are loaded and unloaded together. And uh, there's a resource package class for maintaining resource packages. And it has like the load function for, for loading it. And a is complete function to check for completion. We, we, always, we always load these packages in the background. So when we call load, the load doesn't happen immediately, it's actually queued. And then we can check is complete then, uh, or we can call complete explicitly to, to flush it into, into memory sort of. But uh, so you use, if you want to write like a streaming solution where you stream in some content from disk, uh, uh, like stream in the next level in the background, you use the exact same solution as you do for, for loading, loading regular stuff. So there's no, no difference there. Um, this load function that loads the data uh, will call load resource uh, in the resource manager on each resource, uh, which will in turn call uh, add request to queue the resource on the resource loader. So there is kind of three classes collaborating here. The resource package holds the package itself the list of resources, the resource manager knows what resources are loaded and can load and unload them. And then the resource loader has a background thread for, uh, for loading the resources. So in the resource package here, uh, it's pretty simple. Yeah, it just loops over all resources here and load some. There's the bundle is kind of a special case. We'll talk about that later. And, and in the resource manager, um, we have some low resource function here. Yeah, that just uh, creates a request uh, for loading this resource and queues it on our queue of requests and posts this to the to the resource loader. And the resource loader uh, just has uh, uh, things like this. It has a definition of a request where you specify the resource you want to load. If you're loading it from a bundle or not. And then you post these requests and they get processed by background thread. And this background thread is pretty simple too. Uh, we have a queue with all the resources. And in this background thread, see where we have it. Uh, here we process one request at a time and we load that data either from a bundle if it's bundle resource if we're loading from a bundle or from the exploded database uh, that I talked about in the previous talk if we're, if we're using that. And once it's loaded, it's, the request is put back on an output queue where the resource manager can again uh, process it. Uh, so, so what happens in the resource manager it has a function called complete request, which is called when a, a request is done from the resource loader. And it will sort of, what happens here is basically that it puts that resource into our list of, uh, list of resources. So it just stores resource data into our list of resources. Then it adds a stream also if this, if this resource has a stream too. But basically that what it does. Increases the reference count and stores the data. Um, 
So that's the basic procedure for loading resources. And unloading resources is, is pretty similar. Uh, it's done by the package again. So we want to unload the package called unload on all the resources that belongs to the package. And uh, the resource manager on, on getting this, uh, this, me this message, it decreases the reference count on that resource. And if it's zero, uh, the memory is freed and there is, we let go of the resource. And the reason why we have a reference count is, of course, as I told earlier, that the same resource can exist in, in multiple packages. And we don't want to load it multiple times into memory, so instead we just load it once and then we use the reference count to sort of keep track of how many times it's loaded so we know at which point we need to free it. Um, patching up resources when you've when you've loaded sort of the resource data the raw resource data from disk you may need to do some some patching of it some pointer patching maybe you're creating objects from it uh, now most of the resources in the engine require no patching at all uh, as i said earlier most when we use our new serialization system all the, resor the resources are just binary blob uh, binary blobs and we read them straight into memory and we don't need to do any patching or anything of that data we can just use it straight away from memory um, but there are some resources that net need some kind of patching as i said before we have old serialization code in some places and in that case we actually have to take the binary data that we loaded and run the deserialization function to get back um, the objects that we want so there are two uh, two ways of doing that there are two different callbacks that can be used to to do this kind of patch up if you need to do it uh, the first one is called load you can create a load callback that callback will be called by the resource loader on the resource loader thread to deserialize your data. Uh, and that's typically what you do if you're using the old serialization system, then the, the data will be deserialized on the resource loader thread. And the nice thing about that is that it doesn't stall the main thread. So you can sort of do this uh, processing of the resource without consuming any resources on the main thread. It still happens in the background in the resource loader. Uh, then there is another callback function that you can use called bring in and the difference is that uh, unlike load bring in is called on the main thread when we sort of complete the request and add the resource to the, the resource manager we call bring in uh, so the advantage of this one is that it's called on the main thread so you can do stuff as like you can query for other resources if you need to if your resource need to have links to other resources you, or, or some other information about other lead loaded resources, you can do that in the bring in function. And um, this, this way that resources are loaded is actually registered in application CPP. So if you open that file, go to set up resources. Uh, uh, we have here, if you remember in the compiler, we had a, a registry that sort of re, re, uh, registered the compiler for each type. And here we have another registry that registers the loader for each type. And as you can see, most of these don't register any loader at all. And that's because they use this new uh, binary blob serialization format. So they just use the data directly out of memory and don't need any any patching but as you see we have uh, quite a few resources that still uses an explicit load function uh, so they don't use the new system so those are the resources these are the resources you would look into if you wanted to remove the old resource system uh, completely and of course plugins can register their own uh, resource loaders just as they can register their own uh, resource compilers um, once you once loading has completed uh, and all the resources have been loaded you can access them through the resource manager so the resource manager basically just, a, just has a hash of all resources 
uh, and it has functions uh, that you can call then uh, uh, get to make a lookup of a particular resource and this is a templated function that automatically casts a pointer to a specific class uh, if you want that. It's also a can get function that uh, will tell you if the, whether the resource is loaded or not. Uh, now there's oh yeah there's also an open stream function uh, in the resource manager that lets you access if the resource is compiled with a stream that will give you uh, a future input archive to that stream so that you can start streaming data if you have a streaming resource you can open a sub part of that stream also at the particular size and offset uh, now one important thing to note is that getting a resource doesn't lock it in any way. If you just, if you just call get and you get back uh, a resource, that resource is a pointer to some memory. And when we unload the package that that resource resides in, that memory will be freed and your pointer will point into unallocated memory and, and your program will just crash. Uh, so that's kind of a bad situation and we have optional locking in the resource manager uh, so you can if you want to you can call lock and unlock on your resource and if you do uh, we have a little reference counter that keeps track of how many locks and how many unlocks the resource has received so it knows if it's kind of if it's kind of safe to unload the resource or not and if you unload a resource that is locked, uh, you won't get just a crash, you will get an error message, and then you will get a crash, which might not seem like a great improvement, but it kind of is, because the error message will tell you which resource uh, is still in use, and hopefully you can, from that, it's pretty easy to find out the error in your, in your game code, uh, where you sort of uh, release the resource even though you're still using it. Uh, so, but currently only some resource types actually use this lock unlock mechanism. I know the, the unit resource uses it, for instance, because that's one of the resources that's used the most and it's easy to forget to, uh, to forget the, the package stuff for it. Um, so one thing you might argue, ask is like, well, rather than this explicit unload of, of resources, should we, should we have some sort of reference counting and garbage collecting instead so that when a resource isn't used anymore, uh, it gets unloaded and as long as it's used somewhere, uh, it, will, it will stay in memory. Now that, that prevents us from, from ever having this crash because we'll, as long as there's a reference to the resource, we'll just keep it around. But actually, I don't think it's a good idea because using these reference systems tend to lead to, in my mind, it tends to lead to less control. Um, because if you have a crash like this, or even better, a crash like this, it is pretty obvious what is happening. Somebody, is, somebody has released a resource that is still in use. While as when you're using reference counting, the errors you start to get is much more subtle. It's, it's like, yeah, I have lots of resources in memory that I don't want there because someone is referencing them. But, but who is doing that? Where are the references coming from? Those are kind of tricky t things to, to suss out. And also, it's not always good to have like the unload of a resource happen at the random point, like whenever the last reference is dropped. Uh, you might want to spawn that resource again. You could solve that by holding a, re a reference somewhere else, but uh, that kind of gets complicated too. So I actually think the sort of more explicit unload of resources is, is preferable to, to reference counting or garbage collection. Uh, so one question that may arise um, might be what what happens in the editor? What happens when we're using the editor? 
And when you're using the editor, and, and remember the viewport of the, in the editor is just the engine running, and that engine doesn't know what units might be spawned. The, un the user might drop in whatever unit in, into the viewport and expect it to be rendered. So we can't really create a package that contains everything that, that the editor viewport might use. In that case, we would have to create a package with, with everything in it, which, uh, which kind of defeats the purpose because that would take forever to load. So to handle this, we have uh, an autoload mechanism. We call it autoload. And what that means is simply that if the engine is running in autoload mode, if autoload is enabled, uh, we don't use this package system. Well, you can use the package system together with autoload, but you don't have to use the package system. Instead, whenever you call, if, whenever you call get on a resource uh, to fetch it from the resource manager, it will automatically load that resource if it hasn't already been loaded. Uh, so we will automatically pull in all the resources that we use and no other resources. And in this mode, can get also always returns true because you can always get the resource because we can always get it from disk. And you can enable this mode either in settings any by setting the autoload flag or there's also a Lua function to call it. So using autoload is super convenient as a user compared to using packages because when you're, when you're using packages, you have to think about uh, what resources you are using and, and uh, what's used in this level, what do I need here, and so on. So autoload is much more convenient. So why don't we use it all the time? Well, the problem is that autoloaded resources are, are never released. So, so if we just used autoload, we would never we would never release the memory. It would just get bigger and bigger, which typically doesn't work for games. Now you could ask, well, why don't we use autoload in together, together with the reference counting or garbage collection that I talked about earlier, well, then it starts to get even more complex because, because now we're trying to load the resource when it's spawned. That will typically that will typically cause a stall because we need to go to disk to uh, to fetch that resource, and that's usually not a big problem in the editor because you have you have fast disks in the editor and stalls doesn't matter as much as when you're running around in a game. But in a game, you don't want that. So even if we had an autoload mechanism in the game, we would still want to preload stuff uh, to have it ready in memory from, from where the level starts running. So that means we would still have to have the package concept in order to preload stuff. Um, so it wouldn't really solve anything to have that in the, in the engine. Uh, so the editor uses autoload and with autoload, uh, resources are never released. So does that mean that in the editor we never release any resource memory? Yeah, that's that's actually true. The the resource memory in the editor will just grow and grow as you load more and more stuff. Uh, but this seems to work pretty well in, in practice. It's not causing any, any real problems. Uh, of course, on PCs we have virtual memory to help us with that situation sort of cache away the memory that we're, we're currently not using. Um, another topic, topic related to loading data is hot reloading. So as I said in the previous talk, uh, we really care about fast compile times. But of course, fast compile times don't really mean anything unless we can also reload the data fast. If we have to restart the game, uh, to run the to run it with the new data, then we will always pay the cost, the startup cost of starting up the game. So it does. If we can compile in hundred milliseconds, who cares? It's probably going to take a half a second to boot up the game. So so that doesn't work. So we need a way to to hot reload resources into memory. Uh, and we have a function for that. Uh, it's a console function called refresh, uh, implemented in game CPP. Um, so what it does when, when refresh is called is that it finds all the resources that, is, that have changed since the last time we called refresh. And how do we know that? Well, we know that because the compiler will actually store a list. Whenever the compiler compiles something, it will create a version number and put the list of the files that were modified during that compile. 
Uh, and then when we compile it again, we'll get a new version number and a new list of files and so on. And this refresh function remembers the version number when it last refreshed. So from that and the list of changes at each version number, it can find out what resources has actually changed. So it loads these new resources into memory, then it patches up the instances to point to these new resources. Uh, so for units, for instance, this typically means unspawning the old, the old unit and spawning the new one, uh, the new modified one in the same place. Uh, there are like various degrees of, of how sophisticated this instance patching is. Uh, like there might be some some runtime data that has been changed on the object that we're affecting that that we're replacing with the reload so a question is like how much of that runtime data is preserved and how much is do we sort of throw away when we reload and different resources have a bit of different strategies there um, but you actually do implement this this routine for patching the instances yourself so uh, you get a callback from the from the refresh function and then you can do all the necessary things you need to do in order to move the instances uh, of this resource that have been spawned over from the old resource definition to the new one. And once all the instances have been moved over, we can unload the old resources from memory. Uh, and if you look at Resource Manager CPP, you can find that it has quite a lot of bookkeeping to make sure that things like logs and ref counts are, are counted correctly during all these operations when we do a hot reload and we, when we do auto load or when we, we do a mix of a hot reload or an auto load or something else. We need to make sure you really need to like count properly to make sure that that um, that you keep track of this uh, keep track of this properly. So if you look at this file, you will see a lot of bookkeeping like that, and uh, hopefully it's correct. It's passed enough uh, rounds of bug fixing so that it's it's working now and doesn't have to be touched. Um, patch bundles, another concept that's important for loading. And patch bundles come in mostly when we release games on the engine. As I said in the previous talk, when you when you create a game, you create bundles or pack files that contain the game data. Uh, now, typically, uh, after a while, you will want to make some fixes to your game and release those fixes as a patch. Uh, but since the bundles are compressed, if you just use a regular patch tool to try to create a patch uh, file between the old bundle and the new bundle, uh, these changes become really big. But we actually have a, a built-in solution for this, so you don't have to use any kind of external patch tool. and and that is called patch bundles. So a patch bundle is a bundle uh, that patches another bundle and it contains just the resources that we should modify. So all the other resources, all the unchained stuff is a bundle is, uh, uh, isn't touched. It's just a bundle with the, with the chain stuff and it uses the same format as the regular bundles. So it's just it's just this resource package header, a number of resources, type, name. And now you see this re the reason for this exists flag that I told about, uh, talked about in the previous talk. This exists flag doesn't really make sense for bundles because all the resources exist. But in a patch bundle, you can set this to false in order to remove a file um, in the patch. So you might not, you might not just want to add and modify files, you might also actually want to remove files in the patch. And then you can use this exist flag to do that. So these patch bundles have the same name as the original bundle, but then they have patch zero, patch one, patch two, patch three, and so on, uh, concatenated. And the way it works during loading is that we first load the, the original bundle and then we load each patch bundle in turn. So if a resource is defined in a patch bundle, it will replace the previous, de de uh, previous definition of that resource in the original bundle. And as you can see, you can have multiple patches being applied sequentially, and 
whatever the last one is, is the one that will be authoritative. The last one that mentions a particular resource is the one that will be authoritative on that resource. And as you can see, we're still, we're still walking the disk sequentially. We're loading first the bundle, we're reading, reading that completely sequentially in memory. Then we read the first patch bundle completely sequentially in mem in, on disk from beginning to end. Then the second patch bundle completely sequentially from disk to end. So, so this also is a nice way of preserving those uh, sequential properties. Uh, and of course, since, since these don't require modifying the original bundle, they also work in, in the situation where the original bundle is being distributed on read-only media, such as a DVD, which is becoming less and less uh, a thing we need to worry about. But it was important in the design of the system. Um, these patch bundles, there's a special tool for, for generating them. It's sort of it's one of our older tools, so it's not a new editor. It's a separate, separate older tool called Patch Builder. And to use it, you you specify two project folders uh, that have been bundled, and this tool will sort of find the differences between these two project folders and create a batch uh, patch bundle that contains just the modified files. Now note that it's up to each project how they want to organize their patches. Some projects might want to do this sequential thing to make keep the patches as small as possible. Some projects maybe maybe just use the patch zero and when they do uh, another patch in the future they just create a new patch zero and replace uh, uh, this whole patch zero file. So it's it's kind of a trade-off between how many patches you have which will affect performance a little bit and and how big the patches are but that's up to the project to decide um, we also have a dlc and mod system so dlc's is downloadable content so that's when a user downloads some extra content for a game and mods is basically user generated content user extending the game with their own data and both of these are based on the bundle architecture. Uh, the DLCs are basically just bundles that you can list and load optionally, so you can find out, well, what are my DLC bundles? And then, oh, let's load some of them. Mods are a bit complicated because they, we want mods to be able to patch resources in all of our bundles, like patch all our scripts, for instance. Uh, I won't go into details, on DLCs and mods, there aren't they aren't used that much. The DLCs have used have been used a little. The mods, I'm not sure if the mods have ever been used, uh, maybe by someone. I'm I'm not sure, but but these aren't super used systems. So, but but it's good to know that they're based on the on the bundle architecture. Uh, final thing to know about loading is this override resolution that I talked about earlier, uh, where you can map resources to other resources and this actually happens in the in the resource manager so there's a function here called resource override i think um, that that is called by any can get function so any so these like can get and get functions they take as input an unresolved name this is just the resource id or an id string 64 uh, just as a type, but I use a special name for them here just to keep it clear in our mind when we're using an unresolved uh, name that hasn't been mapped through the override system and when we're using a, a name that has been mapped so, so you don't get those things confused. So there is this resolve overrides function and basically what it do, it checks it checks uh, for our dynamic overrides. These are overrides that are set from the script. So you can say, you can specify from the script, well, I want this unit to always replace this other unit. And then you create a dynamic override. So it checks for dynamic overrides, and then it tests for our static overrides, and it tests, tests these, uh, all these overrides that have either an empty flag, which means that they should always apply, or a flag that is currently set. And when we find the best matching override, we will use that instead of the original resource. So that's it for loading data. Any questions on that?
Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, is there? Uh, I, I remember I heard about you know some kind of um, um, is there a way to load from I don't know any server HTTP server or whatever to share some resource for some reason? Yeah, we have we have a way of of loading bundles from an HTTP server. So you could put the bundle up on an HTTP server and sort of stream it down and then load it as a regular bundle. So there is a system for that. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's take let's take like a 3 minute break before we do the next next part. <laughs> 